I hope you have your bread bowls and spatulas ready for it is another episode of Owl Bear Soup. And I will be one of your hosts. My name is Justin. I'll be your other host, Rich. Um, bread bowls and spatulas, an intriguing combination. Um, how do you how do you put those two together as you put this the bread, this soup the on? Bread, the bread bowls are hot, so you okay. have to so you have to use oh. your spatula to kind of like you know get it out of the oven. You I want did. a nice you do want a nice oh perfect. Yeah. Accidentally. <laughs> yeah. No. <laughs> oh man. Uh, all right. So, oh, so it looks like the um uh the captions might be a little bit behind today, but that's okay. We're we're live, we're doing this thing, we're going. And we're uh yeah, Rich, how have you been? It's been like oh, a week. My goodness. It has been a week. It, in one sense it's been a week, and in one sense it's been uh less than a day. <laughs> Because you and I were uh, playing some Destiny yesterday, of course, like we do. Yeah, um, like we do. Yeah. Like we do. But uh, yeah, uh, it's been a week. It's got a, we've had a whole bunch of news for, um, I can't wait to get into, dive into. So we're talking yeah. today. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I've also been working on uh, getting Twill's twist points out into the wild. And I'm really excited that later on today, we're going to have the fantastic uh, Julian Lieberon Zaitis on to talk a little bit about making this book. Um, been messing around with some munchkin critical role that we'll talk about a little bit later as well Ooh, i'm plugging our own show right now <laughs> right now yeah uh i got a chance to uh play the uh newest dc deck building expansion d uh dark metal uh, and we'll be talking about that a little bit too um as sure. well as of course we're gonna wrangle our guests to build an adventure later on in the show uh with us and with your help chat I need. I'm, I'm realizing as I'm 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 looking in OBS. I need to, for next week, I need to shift my camera over like three inches. But uh, that has nothing to do with the show. So uh, <laughs> if if it looks like I'm looking off to the side, it's because my camera is in a weird spot today. Uh, oh, gotcha. <laughs> That's but hilarious. First, <laughs> but first, so so I we were playing Destiny, and yes. uh, we've, we've we've we we like to talk about Destiny and the way Bungie designs things, and use those ideas in role-playing games and think about how to use them in role-playing games and right now there's a really cool event going on where um you are essentially hacking a pillar thing uh, to gain access to a virtual slash real world mm -hmm. um but the thing that I was really interesting to me is the way that they designed those puzzles to make it interactive with the environment seems like a really fun and cool tool to use whenever you're designing these kinds of puzzles for like D and D and stuff. Um, I also right. really like the rule of threes. Like, um, you know, you always have three phases. You always have three, this, it always takes three to do whatever. And I like that. I like that a lot. I like it too. And I, I kind of like the idea for a major boss battle, like some kind of a magical ritual. I mean, I don't do this as much in D and D, but like, uh, I was working, you know, working on Sentinel Comics, and they certainly have this mm -hmm. sort of thing in their system, which is mid-combat, like a huge shift can can happen. Like, what if during this battle, like the boss flipped a switch or snapped their fingers, and then suddenly you are running through this dreamscape where you have tasks to complete? Um, mm -hmm. Bungie does a really good job of making it yeah. clear what those tasks are and how to do them, which I like so much. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, well, that 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 kind of brings up the conversation that we were also having <laughs> yesterday playing yep. Bungie, uh, thinking about like Van Richten's and how I originally said sliders in the chat and you said quantum leap. Um, yeah. And in the way that you could use the quantum leap idea of having that guide, of having that patron help carry you through the different uh, areas. And mm -hmm. Bungie does a good job with that using the different uh, fire team leaders, the you know your Saint Fourteens, your uh, Zavala's, um, yeah. it, it it they they kind of guide you through that initial process, and usually leading up to that, leading up to that battle, especially if you're doing something like a dungeon, you'll have smaller puzzles that replicate what the bigger puzzle at the end is going to mm -hmm. do. That way, you're already have that in your mind, like oh, remember back there when we had to shoot yeah. this, jump on this and slide under this well now we see that same set of things so let's do that again so so repetition right. i think is, is is they do a really good job at repetition those mm -hmm. kinds of skills they go, do a good job of having a little guide to help people um yeah so i think destiny is a, a good source of information whenever you're thinking about running D. &D. 
I think so. Now I'm thinking about that because I, I like the idea of repetition. Often you you end up with, okay, this boss in D&D has a ritual going. There's three crystals. You're going to need to shatter those crystals. But like I, as the DM, have to tell you that that's what's going on through, yeah. you know, there's no visual for you just to come up with it. But I like the ability for you to figure out along the way, like you've disrupted one of their other ritual sites with some of their minions and you realize these crystals are important. So later on, you're like, are there crystals here? Are there three crystals? Awesome. Okay, we gotta yeah. break them. We gotta break them in this order, or maybe you, you know, you scale up your puzzle mechanic for it. It's a cool way to to implement some some video game design, uh, and I think it would make those. You know, of course, we're gonna explain what happens when you shatter one, and like these creatures get more powerful, and they shout and they come in. Like, there's some great narration that you can do there, but it would make your the tactics of your campaign pretty interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, like that was that was on the brain. So um mm-hmm. yeah, what let's uh yeah. let's dive into some news. Sure. Yeah. Well, <laughs> why don't you I kick it off? off? I'm gonna start off big. Are you ready? Yeah. Um okay. as always happens for reasons, um, Amazon has told us what the next two D D books are going to be. Um yeah. so spoilers. Uh, Ahoy, I suppose. Um, There are two books coming out in the very near future. Um, This first one coming out in September um, is going to be The Wild Beyond the Witchlight. And this is a new adventure story, unlike, um, you know, uh, excuse me. uh, uh, (laughs) Why am I blanking? Candlekeep Mysteries and unlike, um, you know, the Van Richten Guide. Um, Those are books about like small stories, things like that. This is getting back into like the big, huge adventure path sort of sort of thing. the Wild Beyond the Witchlight is deals with the wicked whimsy of the Feywild, um, and is your first chance heading into that. Um, we don't know much more about that. Um, we do know it probably it's going to have some of the stuff from the Unearthed Arcana that we've seen before. So mm-hmm. the hobgoblins of the Feywilds, the fairies, yeah. the owl, owl folk, and the rabbit folk, which is cool. Yeah. Um, but yeah. I'm kind of excited. The The cover looks very interesting. We have this kind of a jester style figure. There seems to be a carnival scene going on um, and some pretty like sinister looking figure with a top hat and a pocket watch. Well, I mean, the, yeah, that, and that makes sense because the Feywild, like at least the way I played it, it's 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 the realm of tricksters. It's, mm-hmm. you know, you're 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 dealing with those types of Denzians and it's it's just a. Uh, you know, it, it it can be like a whimsical place, but it can also be like, you know, you, you, you could have like the whimsy of Disney, but then you could also have the whimsy of Tim Burton. Right. right. Uh, and they're not exactly separate. Right. They could be together. Mm-hmm. They could be, you know. Yeah. So, absolutely. so, so I'm, I'm excited about the Feywild. I like I like the idea of the Feywild. I like taking players to Feywild. You can do some really fun things there. You can absolutely break rules and bend rules in weird ways. And it's fantastic. Right. Which is, you know, one of the reasons I always like Planescape. So going just to the Feywild mm-hmm. and being like, I know you've got a whole set of books that tell you how magic works, but I'm going to do what I want because um, I'm yeah. the DM and you're in the Feywild. Like, get used to it. <laughs> um, yep. Could be very fun. Yeah. Um, also, uh, they let us know that in November uh, is coming out the Curriculum of Chaos, which is an upcoming set released in um, the Magic the Gathering world of Strixhaven, which you know much more about than I do. Yeah, yeah. No, Strixhaven is, is, is pretty cool. So Strixhaven is the current Magic the Gathering set. Anybody in chat, feel free to correct me if I get some of this wrong. I only play on, <laughs> on uh, my mobile device. Um, but there are like five schools or something, and each of the schools are two different colors. So like I've I can't remember the oh, name good. schools, but the, the school that I like the best right now is the blue and red deals with a lot of counters and, and, and fudging with your deck and stuff. Um, and then uh, also in in the Magic the Gathering Strixhaven, there's um, at least two new uh, t- two new ideas that they use. Uh, one of those is being Magecraft. So whenever you play a sorcery or an instant spell. Um, the a character card with with ma- a creature card with magecraft on it gets some kind mm-hmm. of ability for that round. So something along the lines of if you play a sorcery, you know, magecraft, uh, this creature gets plus one plus one and can't be blocked until the end of turn. Something like okay. that, right? Okay. Um, and then the other one, which I really like, there's like learn and lessons. Um, and I may be getting those terms a little mixed up, but if you play a card with the learn keyword on it. 
what it does is then you can go to your sideboard and pull a lesson card from your sideboard and put it into your hand. So it gives you a wow. lot more flexibility and it and it kind of uh, emulates the, the idea of the, that you are that student and you are learning these things as you're going. Um, yeah, no, it's a really cool set. I've been drafting a lot from it um, and I've been playing a lot of, uh, you know, a lot online, but poorly. Uh, but that's okay. I'm mean, sure, still having sure. fun. Yeah, because you know <laughs> I haven't spent money on it yet. Yeah. <laughs> wow. But I've been enjoying I mean, it. It's like it's this. it's a really cool set. That is very cool. Um, yeah, I was just reading a little bit about the the five schools that we've got here and their focuses. I like that Prismari. archaeomancy. Yeah. yeah, the Prismari. Um, that's Quandrix with numeromancy. Very cool. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm kind of excited for this, and I'm curious if they are going to basically be writing right because all of these books have a mini adventure set in them like will it be mm -hmm. a mage school style adventure i'm very curious what that's going to look like yeah um, i'm also i'm also curious what the um uh player options are going to be for this i mean definitely they're going to be magic themed but they've got to make sure that those get out to the barbarian and they get out you know right so shouldn't there be options for right. everybody uh, certainly we're getting a new wizard school i i would hope <laughs> uh, and it'd be cool if it could incorporate some of those ideas into it that you were talking yeah. about from the, the set yeah dj regular yeah no i almost any game i play poorly whether it's <laughs> online or in person so yeah <laughs> I understand games. I just play the point mostly because I want to do I want to do the weird things. Like if if a game and we were talking about this a little bit, right? If a game has has a mechanic in which like if you don't accomplish X or Y, you can't win. I, those are not my kinds of games. Yeah. I want the game where there's like, oh, there's a sliver of chance that you can win if you decide to go with this strategy. And that 100 percent mm -hmm. is the strategy I'm going to go with 900 percent of the time. Uh, I'm also right. really good at math. I <laughs> I just I, I think it's so fun like to 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 get that one weird win. Like I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, my favorite my favorite deck of magic was one with the brain geyser where it's like if I had the right two or three <laughs> two or three cards, yeah. I could cause you to, you know, draw and discard your entire deck, right? Mm -hmm. It yeah. it only happened like once in a blue moon, but when it happened, it was hilarious and I loved it. So right. anyway. I, I remember when people knew you were playing a deck like that one and they mm -hmm. would be like, well, I'm saving my counter spell for your nonsense. Oh, yeah. Like it's mm -hmm. whenever you're ready, it's not going to happen. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. So oh, you kind of had to hide that you were playing the brain geyser deck and <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's fantastic. Um, but well, yeah. I'm excited for both of those sets. Uh, we should find out more about them at D and D live, which will be July 16th and 17th. Um, we talked about that before how G four is going to be putting that on. So who the heck knows what's going to happen? <laughs> yeah, it's going to be wild. All right. Yeah. Uh, my first, first little bit of news, uh, we're going to move over to the, uh, our friends over at renegade games. They are putting out a new expansion for their rivals, vampire to masquerade expandable card game. Um, and this is going to, uh, this is the Blood and Alchemy expansion. So that means they're going to be bringing forth the uh, Tremere and uh, cards, as well as you'll get a Thin Blood pack with that's 49 cards in a 30 card Crypt pack. I don't know what any of this means. Um, the, <laughs> the big uh -huh. reason I bring it up yeah. is because, because one, we're talking about a lot of card games. Two, I really like card games. And three, I really, really want to play this game. It looks like mm -hmm. a ton of fun. I, I just, I love, I love, I love card games. Um, yeah. So anything Vampire to Masquerade plus card game, yes, yes, I'm into it. Oh my god, you just made me remember the old um, Vampire CCG that I cannot remember the name of. Um, uh, there was, wasn't there two of them? But they were like one after the other. I just never got enough cards to really, really play it, which happened with a lot of CCGs that came out around yeah. then. So I love getting a box with the cards. Like, let's go. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, and this, I, I love the expandable card games. Uh, Fantasy Flight does them as well. Uh, they have a really good Warhammer one. Uh, there is a, a Marvel one from Upper Deck that I love a lot called Versus. It's all Marvel characters. It's, yeah, it's all great. Nice. Uh, yeah, this is coming out on uh, what, what you've got linked here is CrowdOx, which is another one of the the many crowdfunding sites. It looks like this is already mm -hmm. funded, so you can just back it and uh, get it at some point. Yep. Cool. Cool. 
All right. What do you got for us now? Uh, well, I also have a crowdfunding thing next because on um, Kickstarter right now is the Blue Rose Adventurer's Guide for 5th Ed from Green Ronin Games. Um, Blue Rose is a really cool world. Um, I, I, I love the way they've designed it. It's it's. I'm trying to think of the exact words they use. Um, uh, fantasy. It's not fantasy romance, but it's got that kind of sense of romance about the mm -hmm. entire thing. Um, I kind love of it. a it's Princess really cool. Bride-esque. There we go. Absolutely. And it deals a lot with uh, very cool fantasy elements. Um, there's a lot of, you know, intelligent animals that you can play, which I like. A lot of people play cats in that one. There's a lot of focus on um, on romance between characters. And there's a lot of focus as well on helping each other. Like the relationship dynamics in that game are important and they help your characters out a lot. Um, so I just love that it has this, this element. It really puts a different spin on the way that fifth ed works um or, or any role-playing game this was with the the uh the age system initially and now it's coming out for fifth ed um so i i totally recommend that you check this out this is going for let's see um the pdf is 25 dollars along with any stretch goals coming out on here um giving you tons and tons and tons of different options to add to your game um you can also check out of course because let's do two different books at the same time. Um, you can also pick up The Book of Fiends uh, by Rob Schwab, which is a very different kind of book, but <laughs> um, it is another fifth ed uh, port from uh, Green Running Games. So check them out. Nice, nice. Um, uh, so, Richard, how do you yeah. feel about trains? Uh, I, I, I like trains. I mean, how do you how do you like games that use cognitive skills like logic, spatial reasoning, and sequencing? <laughs> ah, dang it! I hate puzzles. No, no, uh, that's <laughs> great. Okay, you've caught so, my attention. <laughs> so, Ticket to Ride uh, Track Switcher is a brain teaser puzzle that is coming from uh, Days of Wonder. So, if you love if you love your Ticket to Ride, you love these kinds of puzzles. Uh, Ticket to ride a uh, track switcher. Uh, so players will use cognitive skills like logic, spatial reasoning, sequencing to direct locomotives and shift trains into their correct positions. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's it, it's essentially just a little... I, I don't know. Is this a game? Like... <laughs> I mean, it no, is a game, no. but it's, but it's, well, yeah, but it's like yeah, it's a puzzle game. <laughs> yeah. It's a puzzle game. It's a, you know, it's a standalone game designed for single player. Uh, it mm -hmm. includes one uh, board, uh, one game board with tray, 40 different puzzle cards so that you can use the, you, mm -hmm. so essentially you, you can figure out 40 puzzles to try to sort yeah. out. And then um, this is one of those things where if it does well, there will clearly be more puzzles and more expansions coming out. So. Right. Um, you remember, uh, I'm trying to think, whenever I would go into certain bookstores or game stores, there would be that plinth in the middle of, of the room all on its own that you could gather around. And there was a game on it where it was a, it was a traffic jam and there was a taxi on it. Oh, yeah. You needed to get mm -hmm. the taxi out. This is that game. Um, yes. You were you're moving the, uh, the, the engines of these trains around on these tracks where they're actually moving back and forth mm -hmm. and trying to get the right cars onto the right train so that everybody can leave. Um, yeah. So if that game is a good game which i thought it was always fun i mean it's uh some of those puzzles are really hard very carefully moving them around sometimes you just tip them over and knock all the cars aside that's uh, what i did most of the time this sounds good yeah yeah my taxis often uh, had monster truck wheels so that they could go over cars when i got frustrated hold on that's not how that game works <laughs> i mean it's how it works it's it's good <laughs> <laughs> very cool um Awesome. Well, next up, I, I want to take a quick look. We've talked about the Dune RPG a little bit lately. And uh, and if you are out there like, I don't know if that game is for me. I want to check it out. Um, Modiphius, I, I believe, this week. Um, oh, that's not true. Um, it's uh, It's been out for a little bit. Um, we just got the <laughs> notification about it. Um, you can check out the Adventures in the Imperium Worm Sign Quick Start Guide. Um, this is a single book it is 32 pages long it's meant to be like a starter box sort of deal for the dune rpg it gives you a rundown of the rules it gives you some um uh pre-generated player characters that you can play and a short adventure that you can lead them on um i'm pretty excited about this system and i really want to dig into the 2d20 uh sort of deal and Sweet. uh this is kind of a cool way to to get a sense of how it works without buying the entire book um because the rules, uh, as related in here, are actually pretty straightforward. 
uh, and understandable. The the book itself is what gives it like the breadth uh, that I want out of an RPG. Um, yeah. So check this out. And if you're you're interested in running a, a game of Dune, here you can play a, a bunch of folks from House Arrakis, and you can head out there and protect the spice. Yeah, it's protect Dune that spice, does, right? Protect yeah. that spice. <laughs> it's free. It's on drive through RPG. The, the spice must travel. <laughs> Is that what? Yeah. All, All right. right. So uh, I, I gotta make some notes. You're out. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I'm the worst. <laughs> uh, so uh, <laughs> talking about talking about uh, tabletop RPGs and uh, different systems, uh, Marvel is going to be bringing the Marvel Multiverse RPG to us. Uh, we are going to get the playtest rulebook in March of 2022. So we'll get a chance to kind of play it, provide feedback on it, that type of stuff, kind of like they did with uh, D&D Next. And then the mm -hmm. full game will launch sometime in 2023. So uh, one important thing to know about this game is it's going to be using the D616 system. So um, I, you know, I, 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 I don't know how many dice that is or what size dice a 616 is, but, uh, you know, I'm pretty into it's it. Not a it's not a platonic solid, so I don't care. <laughs> um, I, I, I love the idea that there's this huge table with 616 entries, and you just use your phone. To, to roll. <laughs> you can roll whatever you want, right? Just slash yeah. roll 616. <laughs> yeah, 616. Uh, yeah, so no, I'm, I'm curious what the D616 system is going to look like. It's, oh, sorry, 616. Uh, yeah, 616. <laughs> <laughs> uh but they they're saying it's an accessible and easy to learn system for newcomers to tabletop rpgs um and it's kind of the natural evolution for those familiar with other popular uh, role-playing games on the market so uh yeah no i'm pretty excited about this this this, this is gonna be pretty mm -hmm. interesting and i am yeah. uh I, I i i i would like to uh reach out to uh, matt forbeck and uh give us give us some previews here i want to i want to yeah. get into this I'm excited. I saw a thread on Twitter and it was basically all the designers of the past Marvel RPGs all like being congratulations, join the club, um, mm -hmm. which was pretty cool. <laughs> uh, DJ regular uh, did point out in the chat that the stats for this system do spell out Marvel, uh, That's right. which is, which is, which is pretty fantastic. Right. I forgot uh, about that. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's, it's might, agility, resilience, uh, vigilance, ego, and logic. So Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Those all make a lot of sense for superhero characters. That's exciting. Yeah. I'm interested yeah. that there's six, but since it fits Marvel, I'm in. Okay. Yeah. That's good work. Good work. <laughs> Maybe it's a D8 system. And since there's six stats and then you roll two D8s, because two D8s is 16. Uh, oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> oh, it's a stretch. Yeah. Hurt my brain. I just, I just don't know. That's a, that's a strange number. Yeah, um, I'm excited oh, to yeah. hear more about it. I'll do some right. research on that number real quick. Yeah. <laughs> um, very cool. Well, my my last one up is a pretty interesting one. Um, this is a bundle on itch right now, um, featuring 864 different creators who have put their work into a bundle for Palestinian aid. You can get it for five dollars. Oh, nice! <laughs> um, all the proceeds, all the profits, are going to be donated to the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, um, giving assistance to uh, over one million pal one million, excuse me, Palestinians. Um, that's amazing. Very cool idea, and I love. I mean, if if you want to help, that's definitely a way to do it for five bucks. But of course, uh, you were also getting one thousand and nineteen different items um for five dollars i mean that's if, if you're looking for a bundle there you go yeah um that is wild that is wild uh, uh oh i just wanted to shout out thanks uh thanks angie misc for the follow awesome awesome <laughs> um okay cool all right here we go uh astral tabletop so there is a lot of different tabletop systems for playing games online astral tabletop is one of them uh, the the folks in my local Starfinder community they they like Astral, um, which I'm not surprised. But 
uh, it, it, it's a pretty cool tabletop. What they have added, though, is they've added HD video chat for gold and platinum GMs. So if you if you like having video, you like showing off your your pretty mug when you're playing online, or it's a good tool for keeping everyone you know kind of focused on what's going, you know what what, what you're doing. Um, yeah, it's a uh, it's it's pretty it's a pretty solid addition. Um. And I do think after playing some, I do think having faces uh, when you're playing sometimes is helpful if if it's if it's hard for you to keep attention as you're playing the game. Oh man, thanks for the uh, sub. You've been here for 40 months. I don't even know that I'm 40 months old. It's a me, Bondo. Um, <laughs> welcome, welcome, so, welcome, welcome. My Hope goodness. you enjoyed a soup. Uh, it is a split pea soup today in a bread bowl. And uh, yeah, hmm. yep. So, uh, yeah. So anyway, Astral Tabletop adds HD video chat for gold and platinum members. That's fantastic. Um, have you played with any of the tabletop uh, virtual tabletops aside from um, Roll Twenty? Not really. No. Um, mostly because uh, I just haven't dived in. I mean, all of them take I think that moment of like, yes, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna make mm -hmm. the jump and just investigate for a while. It took me a long time yeah. to get roll twenty actually, so I haven't done that yet. Yeah, I keep. I, I've been enjoying roll twenty, but I keep looking at astral and I keep looking at foundry. Like those are the two that I'm gonna try out before I run my next campaign because I do think my next campaign is still gonna be an online campaign. But anyway, gotcha, gotcha. All right. Uh, I'll tell you that I haven't found much else about the number 616, so I guess it's probably Earth 616. Because um, it's just not an interesting number. I mean, sure, it's an abundant number, which means that its uh, its factors add up to more than 616. Um, it's not a prime. I'm, I'm out. That's it. <laughs> Mathematically, not interesting. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But you know what is interesting? What's that? Reviews. Oh yeah, let's let's do it. Let's get some All reviews right. going. All right, here we go. Uh, <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. All right. Uh, yeah, we got some. We got some, we got some pictures of some cards up here. These look. These. these yeah. What? These don't look Those like Munchkin cards. Right, right. So this is uh, this is Munchkin Critical Role, which came out recently from uh, Steve Jackson Games. Uh, we got a copy from the Op, which is fantastic. Um, I I don't know about you. I've been playing Munchkin since uh, I don't know forever. It feels like, <laughs> and uh, and it's a game that is all about kicking down the door, beating up monsters, getting treasure, met, and uh, and also stabbing your friends in the back. That's Munchkin. Yeah, um, yeah, that's Munchkin. And, so I was very excited to actually take a look at a version of Munchkin, which focuses on a group, the Critical Role team, which is not about stabbing each other in the back, right? It's it's uh, totally about cooperation and you know the very D and D ness of of getting out there. Like Munchkin feels like Hackmaster, Critical Role. It's a different story. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, so I really enjoy taking a, a quick look at this game. It is different if you played Munchkin in the past. Uh, I, I've both played and taught many, many students because uh, the, the kids I know love playing Munchkin. It's just a ton of fun. Um, gain levels, once you get up to level 10, uh, you win. Um, that's it. And so you try to keep your friends from getting there first while you get there by, by through your cards, through your items that you were gathering, through the classes that you were taking. Um, and all the classic Munchkin stuff is in here. Um, Although the cards are totally different, all featuring art and uh, and names that resemble the the folks that you know from Critical Role. Um, there's quotes both from the actors and the characters that they've played in the the Mighty Nine series, um, which is pretty dang cool. Um, that is cool. Uh, so I keep looking at the cards over here, but I know our time isn't synced up perfectly. But gosh, I like them. Um, D and D fans are going to find a lot of the cards in here that you recognize. Instead of seeing things that are kind of like, you know, from the original game that are like a little too ridiculous to be D and D, you're going to see periaps of wound closure. You're going to talk about hexblade curses. You're going to see the things that you recognize from D and D, um, because that's what's going on here. And you'll also see a lot of the characters um, and enemies from the Critical Role campaign, which is really fun. Nice. Um, but th that's the expected, right? Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the differences. I know one yeah. of these pictures has a d20 in it 
It does. There's an optional an optional rule in this version of um, of Munchkin, which I recommend you use honestly, which is after you've figured everything out, right? You've added all your your bonuses together um, to see how strong that monster is, and you oh gosh, you're you're down by two, right? It's like 18 versus 20 or something like that. Um, you can have both sides roll a d20 and add that in as well, like adding that huge amount of D&D randomness to the game, which uh, is number one, kind of fun, but also in a different way, it makes the game nicer, right? If I got an 18 total and you added a 20 to that monster because you like added a, it's, uh, I don't know, you cloned it and you made it super strong or whatever else, right? Then you're yeah. the jerk who stopped me from getting a level and killed me. And I hate that. But in this game, you can like help out, but it actually comes down to the D20. I mean, you're not getting up to like, it, it's enough to swing every single encounter, which is kind of fun. So it leaves it a little bit more up to fate, whether you win or lose, whether your character lives or dies, or you have to run away, um, which I think is very fun. Yeah. Um, other differences in here, there are guest stars, because of course, critical role. Um, you can have one guest star in your party at any time. And uh, anytime you want to run away from a combat, right? It's going bad. Oh, I'm not gonna win. I gotta get out of here. Um, you can you can sacrifice your guest star and immediately escape. Um, well, I mean, they're not coming back for the next episode, so exactly. Don't need it. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> we, don't, we don't need it. Um, so I think that's fun because that's penalty is often enormous. Of course, you have to find a guest star, but that's possible. Um, the other rule that they added in here is that the it's no longer a race to level 10. Level 10 is one of the requirements that you need to meet in order to win the game. But the other one is that there are five boss monsters in the deck and the game oh. cannot end until three of them have been defeated. Oh, very so nice. So you are potentially gathering them, keeping them in your hands so that you can play one, you know, for your final victory. But but no longer is the game about, I have a first level monster in my hand, and once I'm like super powerful and level nine and my attack bonus is plus 50, I'm going to beat up this level one piece of toast. Um, now it's, it's really like, I got to beat a boss in order to win this game. Um, nice. And so now the fight is like much more epic. I mean, there's still like the help other people, the the stealing items, you know, stealing levels from people. There's all the shenanigans that you expect from Munchkin. But this game has kind of gone out of its way to make it a little less about being combative, even though it still is that combative Munchkin game. Um, yeah. And so so as I look at this, as I, as I was taking a look and, and messing around with the cards, I, I felt like... I wish this is the game that I had to teach my students uh, how to play Munchkin because it does have those bits of like, I'm not helping you for just my benefit, but I'm helping you because, well, that's one of the bosses down. Perfect. Okay. We're going to get a little bit farther. Right. Or, um, you know, finding these <laughs> weird kind of treasures and, and making sure that they go to the characters that they kind of match. Like I would be in here. And if I was playing, um, I mean, there's full kid, excuse me full character art for everybody but if i was playing jesper and uh oh my gosh uh and i wanted the items that matched jester excuse me um wouldn't i like go track those down like wouldn't yeah. i be happier if i found them like if they're here in the pile okay well i'm a mage but also uh i'm playing i'm playing caleb so i want that staff because that goes with me a little bit better like it feels like the fandom is in here uh, in a really really nice way without being like totally overpowering nice awesome. so I'm here to tell you that uh, that I like this game of Munchkin, and uh, I, I recommend that you check it out, actually. If Munchkin is a game that is, I mean, if you haven't played it already, you should play Munchkin. Everybody should play Munchkin at least once. Everybody should play um, Munchkin. Yeah, and this is a great version of it to play. Of the many Munchkins, I recommend Munchkin Critical Role. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, ooh, hey, 54 Aqua Snakes. Uh, I hope you don't have those all in one bucket. Uh, thanks for <laughs> subbing for 37 months. Man, 37 months, Perfect. and we had a 40 months not too long ago. Whew. People have been around for a while. This is great. Yeah. This is awesome. Um, yeah. No, this game looks great. This is... I I, I got burnt out on Munchkin. Um, yeah. But this is a version that I'd be interested in playing. Um, yeah. It was... I, I'm with you, right? It was it was hard mm -hmm. to play Munchkin once upon a time. You had those bad games, and you don't want to play it anymore. Yeah. Seeing, like, my students start playing it again was really interesting because it was like, what do they like about it? Oh, they love the the fighting and the infighting and the cool stuff. And I get a, I've, I've got a, this huge set of armor. Great. Um, you know, and it's an easy way to have that experience. And this is a good version of it. So nice. Nice. 
Well, yeah. Uh, so oh, you so recommend this art. game? Look this looks great. Art. It's beautiful. <laughs> All right. So uh, I have a game to review. What? Should we check what? that out? I'm ready. I'm prepared. All right. All right. So so we're going to have to travel through the multiverse and get to the other side of, of the multiverse, into the dark multiverse, to talk about this next game. And this is the uh, DC deck building... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Oops! I, I, I hit a weird button. Sorry. This is a awesome <laughs> picture. Perfect, isn't it? It's so good. So uh, this is a D. I'm going to be talking about the DC deck building game. Uh, this is a new game from. Uh, ooh, why are, why are things disappearing on me? There we go. Uh, DC deck building Metal Knights or Dark Knights Metal. This is based off the Dark Knights Metal series from DC. Um, oh, I guess I only have two pictures. That's fine. Um, I didn't have a lot yeah. of time to take pictures because I really did finish this game up right before <laughs> we started <laughs> streaming. Uh, so take a step back. I love DC deck building. This is one of my favorite series of games. I love the, the deck I building. I love this ver this version of deck building. Um, I like it better than like your Dominions or any of those types of games as well. But that's just because I like how fast it is. I like the flow of it. I like the theme. I'm a big fan of DC Universe and all DC comics. In fact, I just finished reading Dark Knight's Metal probably last week. So it was all very fresh in my mind as I was playing oh, this nice. game. Um, for those who are um, uninitiated into this game, the typical setup for this game is you have a one big stack of cards. That's kind of your your the, the, the entire library, right? And then you put... Uh, five of them out in a row, and those are the ones that you can buy from. And then there's usually a stack of villains, and those are the bad guys that you all have to fight. Uh, and then there's a stack of what's called kicks uh, and uh, weaknesses. Your hand starts, like most deck building games, you have a way of building up currency as well as ways of, of, of you know, messing with other players so you buy these cards you slowly build up and then you knock out the super villain you put super villain in your deck and that becomes a really powerful card you have so that's the normal game of dc deck building right and you usually one of the really cool things is they you you get to pick a hero and that hero is you that's who you represent and your hero has special powers so say you're playing the flash in the original one and anytime you play a card that says or that says draw a card you draw an extra card right so that's the flash represents his flash powers mm -hmm. different powers different things so in this game you you pick a hero uh but you start the game with the batman who laughs uh has captured batman so batman is a character that you cannot start with right as you're okay. going through the game uh you no longer have kicks you have another uh power i don't remember what's called up the top of my head i should have brought the game box with me but it it <laughs> works similarly to a kick but it's to represent that you're going back and forth between the multiverses um and it's a competitive game it's very fast paced uh as you kill villains you then will uh rescue heroes so then you pull one from the stack of heroes and then you put it under the batman who laughs so now you have batman and maybe oh. another one right so now okay. there's two there or maybe more um and then there's ways that you can swap your hero out for one of the heroes that's underneath the batman who laughs so you don't stay with one hero the entire game and these the, that that's kind of an explanation of the new mechanic that they've put into this game um and after playing it we played it with uh, three players uh we all messed up at least one rule, but we, we figured it out like after a couple of turns, which is pretty yeah. normal for these kinds of games. Um, and then before we decided to uh, look at who won uh, with scores and everything, we, we decided what we liked about the game, if we liked the game. And we all unanimously decided that we really enjoy this version of the game. Uh, this is not the version of the game that I would recommend to a new player. I would okay. recommend one of the other versions. Uh, this has a, a little bit of extra complexity. And uh, if you've been playing the game a lot, that complexity is great. Uh, the cool thing about the DC deck building and all its expansions is that they are all interchangeable. So you can take parts from one and put it in the other um, mm -hmm. because everything's pretty similar. So um, there's several different card types. But what you could do is you could take all the superpowers out of one set and put them into another set or you know mix and match or stuff like that. Uh, at some point in time, I want to take all the sets and dump them into one box and just like play it <laughs> on the table with like three Amazing. or four other people and just plow through everything. But uh, yeah, so uh, Dark Knight's Metal. Uh, I, I, I enjoy the heck out of this game. 
Yeah. Gosh, yeah. I every single time like this game comes up, I mean, um, not to like make this difficult but I, i'm a big fan of the marvel's legendary game um mm -hmm. uh the great another deck builder right these two came yep. out at pretty much the same time i think yeah. um but you got me into this one i've only gotten to play it a few times and i really really liked it for exactly what you said that flow and kind of the way it is all put together it does feel like a big super ending um mm -hmm. which i like a lot um yeah Dark it's more Knight's the metal yeah, it's more the Ascension <laughs> style of deck building for those yeah. who are into deck builders, uh, which I like. I like the very fast paced system. Um, yeah. If you wanted to compare this to the Marvel one, the Marvel one is a, uh, it's the um, upper deck system yeah. of Legendary. And so that's one where typically you are co-op, you're playing together, and then you have the potential, depending on which game you're playing, that someone will become the enemy. Um, I think in the alien one, somebody somebody can become yeah. the enemy. Um, I don't know about the Marvel one. I remember there were some issues with the Marvel one initially, the legendary one, where the um, text was hard to read, but they revised that in later editions. So that's definitely another great deck building game. Uh, this one is not co-op. This It's competitive. There is a yeah. co-op version of the game that you can get. It's an expansion. I have it. It's fantastic. Um, but yeah, in, in you know, another thing that's, you know, and you can kind of see it in this image here, um, is that they, the art is the art from the comics. Um, and it's, it's, it's re for, for someone who has just finished reading uh, this, this series, it was really cool to see some of the characters that were important to that series that weren't super important in other, uh, in other games and other series at the time. Like uh, you can see on, on, on here, uh, Detective Chimp. Uh, Detective Chimp is amazing. He's one of he's one of, he's always been one of my favorites in the DC uh -huh. universe, and uh, you know, and but he plays a really big part in the Dark Knight storyline, uh, not just Dark Knight's Metal, but some of the other ones too, especially the 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 portions dealing with Wonder Woman, um, and, and and dealing with Justice League Dark. Uh, but yeah, seeing seeing obscure characters like Detective Chimp in here is it it, it brings a smile to my face. Right. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, if it was a mainstream release, you would not see some of these characters. But yeah, it is. It is a tight storyline, right? So. Oh yeah, super out. tight. Exactly. Yeah. That's great. And uh, yeah, and it has. It just has some really fun and unique mechanics that makes this a very different version of the game than the previous versions. But you still, um, you you still can follow the system because they use their own system for all these games, uh, like the Naruto deck. Naruto. Uh, Naruto, Naruto deck building game. Yeah. There's a Street <laughs> Fighter deck building game. Uh -huh. um, you know, and it's it's all the same mechanics, but they do little changes, same base mechanics, little changes to make the game interesting and and a lot more fun. And this this is yeah, it, honestly, like whenever we're done here, I'm probably gonna go play it again. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, uh check in the chat. Um, did you play it with the soundtrack in the background? No, no. I, I'm looking at the chat right now. It's like, I'm going to have to see if that uh, soundtrack is on Spotify. DJ Regular pointed out that the uh, Dark Knight's Metal Comics did have a soundtrack. And I remember hearing that as they were coming out. Um, I'll have to check it out. Uh, That's very cool. Oh, man. And the vinyl comes with really cool art. Totally worth checking out. But yeah, I'm a, <laughs> I'm a, I'm a huge DC nerd. I Oh, mm -hmm. Chelsea Wolf did a song. Oh, wow. That's awesome. Yeah, I'm going to check that out. <laughs> okay. Uh, but yeah, anyway, I, I love I love this game. So I guess kind of short review, not much to dig into because it's a it's an old game. It's not a it's not a groundbreaking game. It's been around for a while, sure. but it's uh oh it's so good. It's so good. <laughs> There's not nothing I can I the but the box the box is fantastic. Everything has a place and it fits in its place. And you flip Ooh. it upside down and the pieces don't go everywhere. Yeah. Oh, so well, I mean I like that it is a game that has staying power. I mean, especially in the Kickstarter era, there are so many games that like, yeah. here's the game, and then it's kind of gone, um, mm -hmm. you know? So I love the idea that they are still... How long has this game been around? I mean, yeah, uh, I think it's been you... Wow. <laughs> yeah, I know you taught it to me, so at least, what, five, six years? Um, yeah. <laughs> so but... that's always good. All well, right. Very cool, very cool. Yeah. Wow. We, we we plowed through some of that stuff a little bit quicker. Uh, let's check into the green room. Uh, is our guest ready to hop on? 
Yeah, looks like a oh, thumbs okay. up. All right. Are you right? Rich, are you ready? Well, in that case, I am ready. Yes. All right. Well, then I will catch up with you guys in just a minute. Sounds great. <laughs> All right. Fantastic. Well, oh my goodness. Uh, welcome to Owlbear Soup. Uh, <laughs> Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. Uh, my guest today is Julian Lee uh, the designer of... Um, well, Storm Hollow for sure. Um, uh, Rift Walker. Code, well, all right. <laughs> You're both designers. <laughs> sure. Yeah. I'll take all that. Okay. Fair sure. enough. The co designer of Storm Hollow um, uh, and Rift Walker, a Storm Hollow game, and the co designer as well of Will's Twist Points. <laughs> I know. I'm so jealous you get to hold that and I haven't seen mine. I don't, it'll be there soon. I shipped them, I know, uh, I know. what, Wednesday? Yeah. <laughs> um oh my goodness how are you doing i'm doing pretty well yeah pretty well. yeah how are things going for you things are good i mean good it's show a, so far a busy time good show so far i mean right i have to talk to justin a lot so <laughs> so it's great um uh let's see um well i wanted to have you on because um storm hollow in particular is a game i mean um it's an incredible game. I love getting to play it at a game storm a long time ago, it feels at this point. Um, but Storm Hollow is this amazing role playing game that was designed with both kids and adults and the ability to, for kids and adults to play together uh, in mind at the time. Um, yes. And uh, and I just wanted to take you know this opportunity to chat with you about making games uh, with kids in mind and kind of the the mental process that goes through designing a system like that. Sure. Um, cool, cool. Yeah. So um for for Storm Hollow, uh yeah, as you said before, it was uh uh, uh designed with both kids and adults in mind because our one of our biggest goals it was um was that we wanted this to be something that families could play together. And so we wanted it to be something that like one of our stated goals was we want the adults to be like excited to play the game. Like we don't want them to be like, all right, we're gonna go play the game with the kids because they like it. Like they want to be like excited to sit down and play this. Mm -hmm. Um so we wanted something that was both accessible for kids and that would be exciting for adults. And um, and just also our sort of through line on that was also inviting to new players. So um, it ended up being, it's a little bit of a rules light system, but it was meant to be something that encouraged creativity, uh, allowed for like people to have fun ideas because, you know, uh, uh, kids in particular will often have like a wacky idea for something that, you know, they didn't read the whole rule book or <laughs> System does are just like I want my character to do this, jump off the thing, and can I use a parasol as a as a flotation device through the air? You know whatever it is, and uh, and we wanted something a system that would just like work for that, you know, and just let people yeah. work, like have these uh, fun stories to tell in a in a fantasy story uh, book kind of universe. So um, one of the sort of focuses we had on it was we ended up you know paring it down to just six skills and to make it easy for a storyteller, a new storyteller to run and also easy for people to understand. It was like, you know, whatever you do, it's one of these six things and you roll the dice and if it comes up with a hit, it works, you know? Right. Um, and you've got special dice for this game as well, right? With with elemental sigils, all sorts of things on them. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, the, yeah. The, to make it easy again, one of the things we were trying to uh, get behind is instead of using standard dice uh, where you'd be like, I mean, you could basically play Storm Hollow with D6s and say, uh, four or a higher is a hit. Like you can do that if you want it, because that would be the same. Yeah. Uh, but we didn't want to do that. We wanted the special dice. So you just like you know, you roll. You get to immediately see if you see like the little sun symbol come up on it. Uh, you know, you've got a hit on that die, um, and you can easily yeah. tell like how many hits are there, there, and and move on with it. Um, yeah. And you said there's the elemental symbols on some of them. Those are like the special dice. Um, you get to roll once in a while when you're like really role playing your character right. Um, so we added those ones in because to really, you know encourage role playing and, and just have a little bit of extra fun with it. Yeah. Well, I, I, we, we already got into the mechanics, but I, I totally agree, right? You have this cool thing um, on every single character where you have your, your backpack, right? Where you can just like reach in and a couple of times, pull out whatever you want. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> to kind of really give people that, that creative touch. Yeah. One of the, the things we were really trying to do with it is to try and make it so you didn't have to like fastidiously like write down every single piece of equipment you have and, yeah make it clear that you had some things to play with and how do we you know do that what if there was something that wasn't uh, available that you really wanted so we had the the adventure packs um or adventure kits i think they're called um uh where you have like the six pictures of what's in your pack and that's exactly what you have 
Um, but yeah, the, like you mentioned, there's those two pockets where you have a chance to pull out anything you want. And that was yeah. our way to both have a little fun and also make it so you didn't have to be like, oh, but I really wanted this thing and it's not in one of the packs. And mm -hmm. right, down, you're just like, all right, well, if that's the thing you really want, you know, you just may, roll a die and maybe you pull that out. And oh, look, you did pack that along or that was run machine yeah. at the bottom of the pack. That's great. And now you have that to play with for the whole adventure. And um, on to some degree, it might sound like, well, that sounds really powerful because you could literally pull out anything. And we, we have a little bit of advice in the book, too, of like, depending on what level of silly you want there. Like, when I run it, I usually run it for like, okay, you can pull out anything from a pocket that seems like it would reasonably fit, you know, in sure. your pocket. <laughs> you don't have to. I mean, if you want a more cartoon experience, you can be that like, and the 10 foot, 20 foot, 30 foot pole is coming out. <laughs> right. Whatever sort of um, kind of story you're trying to tell. Yeah. And this, but, uh, this, yeah, uh, it was this a way like, to let people have oh, sort of what they wanted and, uh, and yeah. not have to account for that all the time. And I, I love this because you, you, of course, Storm Hollow is not set in a world of fantasy realism, right? What's uh, how, how would you describe the world of Storm Hollow? Um, I think we called it the, uh, the, the land where all the stories happen. The, the concept of it was really that, um, every fairy tale you'd ever heard of, um, you know, every legend or myth or whatever, uh, was the result of someone from our world uh, stumbling in, you know, sort of Narnia style into this strange world. Uh, and they come back with the story of their adventures there. And then, you know, over the ages, it gets, you know, warped and turned into a fairy tale and, you know, mm -hmm. twisted in some way that makes it a little more different than it actually was. But uh, that was the, the basic sure. concept. This is the world where, you know, uh, got Rapunzel's story and, uh, uh, you know, Theoretically, Snow White, I don't think that's one we dug into, but even things like uh, Dr. Doolittle makes an appearance there. Just any kind of like story we could get our hands on and, and imagine in from old folklore and stuff like that. We tried to create some sort of space in here where maybe it could have existed or happened. Yeah. And it's it's a really good space because it appeals, I think it appeals to, to kind of everybody, right? I mean, kids definitely, that's that's so open and wondrous and wild, but also adults have that like nostalgia for fairy tales. Um, yeah. Yeah. The idea of writing yeah. them is cool. It's 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 a really it's strongly appealed to just pretty much any any age of gamer. Uh, I would say with the the caveat that like it, it appeals to people in the uh, more gamer world if you really like sort of like a focus on the story or like having that fun creativity. If you're someone who really likes to uh, you know dig into like the grit of a system and like build up a character who has like a specific mechanical special power, which I'm not knocking. I love playing you know wizards on, on an opportunity and coming up with the perfect spell for mm -hmm. that. It's all fun too, but. Uh, it's, you know, it's definitely a character for people that enjoy sort of just going on the fun ride of the story and not necessarily um, digging into like a gritty character builder kind of situation. Sure. Right. Wow. Um, and in the, I mean, Storm Hollow is, gosh, I'm trying to think of a game that I like more uh, in an artistic sense. I mean, there's the, the art it's, that you, you were able to put in that game is incredible. Um, yeah. Yeah. That was a real blessing. <laughs> art director yeah. named Dan May, um, who is a, uh, was fantastic and did a really great job of like roping in a huge uh, team of artists and, and really working with them to like get what we wanted. And it was a lot of also uh, hours of uh, Angie, my co-designer, uh, Angela Hickman Noonan, and uh, uh, I uh, going through uh, like really trying to describe to him. And he, he was great about kind of getting the vision too of like what we wanted the look to be, uh, like, like mm -hmm. wonder that we wanted and, and bright colors and uh, and just a real fun feel of fantasy. So yeah, it was right. And it, it looks like it because this is a game that you you put out on the table, right? I mean, it's it's here, yeah. it's in front of you. You have different boards that matter for the game that are not part of the play. I mean, they are kind of part of the play experience, but like you yeah. are touching those for the most part, right? <laughs> like, yeah, so what is, there's what is adventure, a adventure, feel like, yeah. <laughs> I, I heard you guys in your discussion, uh, I forget what video game was you were talking about earlier, but you talked about like uh, like a, a puzzle you had to solve where you had like different crystals you need to knock out and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. One of the goals in Storm Hollow was to give something like uh, a tangible interface, and it was kind of inspired by um, video game design in that regard. So yeah, some of the it's got uh, a lot of art because we want to be able to, like here's the scene you see, like the, the storyteller can, yeah. start, but also here's a picture of that person, you know. Um, and then when it came down to like the the action based scenes, we have these trackers. Uh, there's like a threat tracker and a progress tracker, and they're like yeah, you know, a little card that has like a real clear indicator put down, um, so you can see when you're doing the right things. Like the the basic uh, crux of a a challenge at the end is usually that the isn't actually like slugging it out with the with the big evil bad guy directly um you can do that but the goal the the bad guy has some sort of goal they're trying to accomplish and the good guys have you the heroes have some sort of goal you're trying to accomplish and it's a race mm -hmm. and uh see who can accomplish theirs first with like the little threat meter being showing the kind of like slug fest in between to try and one up each other um 
And we wanted to make that all very, very clear and uh, sort of to solve the problem of like, how do you know that that what you need to do to solve this problem is to shut down the three crystals? Uh, the problem uh -huh. is what we introduced so that when you can be real obvious about that, like if you're trying to explain to people, then you're like, all right, here's the progress tracker. It will go up when you do this. And you're like, all right, mm -hmm. clear. Or you can keep it more of a mystery, but then when they do the thing that they're supposed to do, you get to like, all right, now look, to progress. You did something correctly. Huh. Um, and that way you could be very, because uh, with a game that gets all like, you know, fun and creative and, and people throwing out like interesting ideas, you still need to, we need to like be able to funnel it into certain lanes to say, okay, but here's the concrete thing uh, that it accomplished. Because, you know, as much as right. I love, I love games that allow you to be creative, I don't, as much love games that are like really on the end of like free form role playing where like just any idea matters uh, and it's all fine. Cause whatever you come up with is sure like out in the air, a little, little too intangible. And, and I like something where it eventually gets nailed down to like, here's mm -hmm. how that helped the situation. Here's how you made. It. So. Right. And I mean, it does a really good job as well with that, the tracker of like having small goals that people can really kind of hone in on, like see them. That's tangible. Okay. Whatever I do in a creative sense is going to get me here and we're going to progress. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which and for I a love. storyteller standpoint too, it, I, I find it helpful because you're like, okay, well, they, they, you know, did this, you know, crazy flip off the banister, swung over, they, they whacked the thing in the head. Like, what does that all mean? We're like, okay, well, they, like, they either lowered the threat because they like made the thing less dangerous or they made progress because they did something that actually accomplished their goal. It's like one of those two yeah. things. Um, and we have a simple tracker there. So no matter what sort of like thing the players throw at you, you have a pretty uh, understandable idea of how you can reward them with, uh, with actual tangible benefits to the scene. Wow. Wow. I, I also love, like you mentioned the threat tracker in there. I love the ability that the game is telling you how you're doing rather than just having to look at like the DM's face and be like, well, they don't look happy. I think. We're yeah. Doing the wrong yeah. Thing. <laughs> you know, there's, there's a lot of, I've, I've seen actually recently online, a lot of uh, discussions about, you know, uh, whether or not like uh, in regards to D and D, whether or not you should tell the players, like what the level of hit points, the bad guy is at, or like, you know, uh -huh. how indicate or like some DMs kind of getting annoyed with players being like, I hate the question when they're like, how's it looking, you know, cause they're truly, but you know, in a, in a real, problem solving situation right usually you have some idea of how it's going like you're not like yeah. <laughs> I think it's going great and then it's like you know once in a while you get surprised but usually if you're putting effort into a situation whether that's you know combat or you know fixing a machine or you know whatever it is you're working on uh even in the real world you have a sense of like it's progress and i think there's this many more things to go and i think that on the whole unless you're really trying to be like super mysterious about it uh for some you know particular plot in mind um, I think it's good that the players have a sense that they're they're doing something that matters, that they accomplished a thing. And then mm -hmm. it's also, you know, um, in, in the reverse of that, it can also be more uh, daunting in a, in a fun story way when they see like, oh, crap, that, you know, the bad guys are really about close to like accomplish their goal. We're almost yeah. going to lose this thing, you know, uh, and can be really motivated. We have to rally and do this. So, you know, mm -hmm. I don't necessarily think it it relieves the tension or, or ruins the excitement of it all. It just makes it clear where where everything's at. So, you know, uh, yeah how things are actually going and feels concrete. Right. Uh, one of the things that I think, you know, on the, on that note that I feel when I'm running games for kids is there is a, there's a balance in there between I'm a kid. I have agency. I am this character. I'm going to do something wild because that's what my character would do. And kind of the scene itself wanting you to do some things, you know? Um, yeah. Uh, so, so the moments where, the, the villain is acting and the plot is coming down and, and the kid is like, but my character, I'm, I gotta go, I gotta go find a turtle. I gotta go find a turtle. That's what my character <laughs> wants. I'm going to do it. And you're like, right now, like right now <laughs> we can do it later. <laughs> <laughs> and so I love that, that your game has this threat tracker that everybody sees and you see it. Like you mentioned from, from video games, you, you definitely, you've got your health bar. You've got your, you know, whatever it is that lets you know the situation is tense here. Maybe yeah. we should stay on track. And I think that's very helpful for people of all ages, honestly, but uh, for kids in particular. <laughs> yeah. And that was sort of like turtle problem you mentioned, like that's also, we, we try to have some things to funnel that too. Like you mentioned like the, the pocket earlier, like when the kid's like, oh, I just got to find a turtle. You can be like, all right, well, it doesn't even take your action to pull something out of your pocket. Like that's just something you do during mm -hmm. your phase. So like maybe there's a turtle in there and then it prompts the question of like, okay, but now you, you have your turtle. Good job. How did you want to use that turtle to like, yeah, <laughs> problem over here. Maybe it's cool, you know, and. <laughs> um, usually when you, that's one of the things I really like about from hollows cause it is it, cause it funnels down to, uh, these skill tricks. Oh, and because we have one of the other things that like one of my favorite rules of the game, uh, is the right tool for the job, like how we handle the equipment. Yeah. 
just if you have the if you, you know a piece of equipment whatever it is it, it does kind of what you if it's a crowbar and like it prize things it just does what you expect and if the storyteller thinks it's particularly useful right you just get an extra die it's the right tool for the job it makes you just a little better at doing it um but it means that when like the kid pulls a random turtle out you know if you want to even if you don't necessarily as the storyteller think it's actually a brilliant idea right you're trying to just have fun with the kid like uh -huh. sure uh you send your turtle over there to like stomp the toe of the dinosaur great uh yeah of course your turtle's extra effective that that's a great <laughs> turtle you get an extra die for your your turtle out there and make yeah. a roll see how cool the turtle runs over and stomps the toe while you encourage him yeah so i love that because like, yeah accommodate those those ideas i love it because your initial like the thing that you would think of first is well that i mean a tur okay you get disadvantage on the roll like sure your turtle you know and so i love that you're taking this absolutely opposite approach like rewarding this creativity and i think that is really important in games where we're not focused on on realism right we're focused on 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 kids being creative being energetic and like rewarding that energy um it's a it's a different style i think of role playing um do you tend to infuse most of your games with that sort of i don't know creative agency um, I try to in in the most part for for tabletop RPGs when I'm running them or, or designing them. Um, for in Storm Hollow, we even talk about like kind of like different ways to like I think we use a slider metaphor of like how you want to set tone and things like that. So yeah, in, in an alternative way, for example, if you as a storyteller like you don't want to set this like really wacky anything goes anything you know you can accommodate that just by saying okay you pull out your turtle and you try to do it and yeah no that doesn't give you the right tool for the job bonus it doesn't yeah well cool, you have a turtle friend but that really isn't going to help solve this problem and you know that's not as fun when you're trying to accommodate like a cool idea of a, of a 12 year old but if you're trying to like rein in a, a set of even like adult players that are getting a little too out there or you're trying to be like i'd like a little more serious tone you know you can set those those borders there and let them know like mm -hmm. that you hit the edge of that wall that's that's not really working but within this world you can still be creative and stuff like that yeah i find that in general um it's okay to set boundaries for people like and it's it's nice when there are consequences and and then things have weight and they matter. But as much as you can, players get more invested in a story and they feel more ownership of it when their ideas are incorporated. You know, as the as the story, yeah. you're you're trying to guide the story along, but you're not in charge of the whole story. Like you're presenting challenges, but your goal is to try and get out of the players um, cool, interesting ideas. You know, role playing, problem solving, and mm -hmm. them with with um, with seeing that stuff actually make a difference in the story and actually affect it. Um, yeah it makes everyone feel much more invested right yeah absolutely uh that is very fun i i know we have been oh my gosh uh role playing for a very long time um yeah. and i can see so much of that in many of the characters and games that you have run over the years <laughs> but i know we've also spent some time playing like mage knight and things like that and bringing out the rulers and seeing how far our miniatures are moving and oh yeah <laughs> so oh, yeah <laughs> um do you, um, let's see, are, do you like still playing role playing in this kind of like focused tactical way? Um, or do you think this has like changed you? Are you a more improvisational storyteller these days? I, I definitely lean more towards um, a, a, a systems that accommodate more creativity and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, it depends that uh, I, I can like a crunchy system where there's like specific details. But I don't yeah. love it when the the crunch like gets in the way. Um, sure. Actually, that happens a little bit too. In even on like a rules light system, like if you take D and D for example. Um, like I loved uh, 3.0, 3.5, and you know Pathfinder first edition. Um, I haven't played the second edition yet, but it looks cool. Uh, and that's definitely <laughs> by most accounts from people that love fifth ed. Like that's a way crunchier version of it, right? And I love the customization right. there. And they had like a rule that would handle almost any situation, and so that can. At least when something's like, oh, I want to do this whack idea, you're like, it's sometimes annoying because you got to look a thing up. But you're like, all right, well, this yeah. is worked. Uh, and fifth ed, I, I really do love that they went to like a little more of a like free form situation. But um, but it also has sometimes the problem of like, uh, if you don't have any rules to accommodate a situation and when a player does something um, kind of creative, you can mm -hmm. also have this moment of like, ah, I get that you want something neat to happen, but I don't know how to, don't know how to make that work for you, or I have to invent a moment right. to work for you. <laughs> um, and it's nice when a system at least tries, like if a system wants to encourage creativity, I definitely prefer it um, when it at least has some sort of solid groundwork to be like, when they get creative, here's here's how you, can sure. here's where, what lane it can go down, as opposed to like, ah, DM, you just make up on the spot why this skill matters at all. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Oh my god, I was just laughing because uh, we we are the people who who look at fifth ed D and D and go, that's a rules light system. <laughs> <laughs> We were I trained mean, in third ed. Different, I different story. I don't know. I don't know who out there is. Uh, what's your history? I know there's rules lighter systems, certainly. Yeah, rules uh, lighter. But, uh, there's, there's, but there's a. As far as D and D goes, it's definitely the more most rules light I've had, and it, it definitely is meant to. Uh, fifth ed seems like it very much is meant to scale. Like if, if you are yeah. a wizard in fifth ed, you still have like you know plenty of spells you need to figure out, and what did you prepare that day from those spells and all of that. But they also have the like I think it's. The, champion is the fighter one that's literally like um the fighter subclass it's like yeah you didn't really that other fighter has all those cool combat tricks you just hit stuff and that's fine you you, you hit do it well yeah than other people <laughs> yeah that's all there is to it go for it you know? yeah that is added in a few places there are some subclasses that certainly are like this option complexity is a little bit lower it's not yeah. you know through the roof that's fair um Switching gears, I, I totally don't remember which of us came up for the uh, the first idea of Twill's Twist Points uh, at this point. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I do, I do. Uh, um, it oh. grew out of, we were talking, we were bantering about things, uh, about, uh, you know, several ideas we had, and, and you specifically had an idea for uh, um, uh, finding things in the environment, like, used to your advantage. Like, the, I remember a twist specifically oh. <laughs> was, uh, was your term. You're like, find, like, these twists where you can, like, do something cool and turn it to your to the environment. It's, that sounds great. Let's, let's go. Yeah. <laughs> well, not to do like a um, uh, an exit interview. I mean, since this project is just ending, but like, um, what's a what what? Gosh, what did you like about doing that project? I mean, I had a great time with it. I thought this was a ton of fun to make and write. Me too. But like, I had a lot. Of fun. Yeah, um, I really liked the. I'd never done a D and D or gaming zine before, and. Mm -hmm. um, I really liked that. Uh, I mean, even though it ended up being like a fifty-six page thing, so it didn't end up being all that short. Um, <laughs> yeah, but it it felt much more manageable. I mean, like we went from like a an idea to a kickstart. Hey, does anyone interested in this? Oh, yay, cool, they are. To like, all right, let's finish and do all this uh, in a much much shorter time period than uh, than any other project I've really had a chance to work on, and that was very satisfying. And it was also nice because yeah. it felt like um, you know, a little bit more like we get to just like have fun with an idea. And not worry about you know the the I don't know, grinding through it over and over again until it reached some mm -hmm. you know perfect ideal version. It was just you know what 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 kind of neat stuff can we infuse this idea with and, and put it out into the world? I like that. Right, right. Uh, it was an idea that we had in what January, and uh, like I said, we we shipped it out this week. So um, yeah. yeah, kind of the small scale project was was a pretty interesting way to do it. I mean, definitely. Um, I don't know, a cool yeah. approach to Kickstarter, a fun little thing. <laughs> yeah, and because we got to like because we knew that going in, we we picked this like very focused thing of like, okay, we're just we're just gonna do a book with these with these scenes with all these different objects that can do neat effects. Uh, and mm -hmm. then so we had that like pinned down. We got to have like a lot of fun within that. You know, the, the scenes yeah. I thought ended up being uh, really varied and the different kinds of places that they describe and the kind of different effects that we allow people to 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 play around with. And um, I hope that people will will find that it's a neat little toolbox for them to add some creativity and rewards for uh for role playing and and, and exploration in there right <laughs> those folks who just want to be like wait what's in the scene what can i jump off of what can i find right. what can i <laughs> absolutely yeah, I, mean, I like that little like our own sense of discovery because we initially when we were thinking about it we're trying to be like well there's all this stuff in here and we don't want to make it so that um so that we've given you a scene full of these neat things and you never get to use them because you didn't even find them right like the goal mm -hmm. is have you noticed these neat things? So we eventually were like, all right, you just you just know about them or you know about some of them anyway, right at the start. Yeah. Uh, uh, a little bit of playtesting discovered that like, well, it'll suit the it'll suit it a little bit better if we make you at least at least you gotta look a little bit. You gotta be like, what's here? And then you can find yeah. it and learn what to do with it uh, to get that sort of sense of discovery. Cause yeah, it's finding that balance between like we want people to to be able to we don't want to give you a fun toolbox of things and then ha 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 you didn't even know it was there because you didn't <laughs> kill roll or something like that like what was the point of that but at the same time you want that sort of still player sense of discovery of i went looking for something neat and oh there it is and i get to feel clever because i have an idea about how to yeah do yeah and it uh, i remember i another kind of video game ish idea that uh this would have that kind of like heads up display like i'm searching the area as things are going on yeah. um which i like a lot it was a, it was a good move yeah, okay. just a, as a, we don't. I didn't necessarily talk too much, the book, but some of the the visuals in the book. I think the cover, uh, initial cover, had that kind of like idea, like you know, zoom in, yeah. on, right? I think to to sort of you know 
mimic a little bit. Like video games do a good job of that heads up, but I think it also uh, plays to people's actual sense of like when you notice something out of the corner of your eye and your brain for a moment, like you know, focuses on that object. It feels like yeah. it goes away for a moment as you like process that surprising thing there that now you have an idea about. Absolutely. All right. Well. We do have an adventure that we've got to write, but since I have you here live on air, let's ask you a, an important question. Are you ready? Are you ready? All right. All right. Uh, I'm just going to say that once upon, I've had some conversations about this recently with, with unnamed uh, sources. Um, <laughs> let's say that once upon a time for a number of years, we ran a campaign that was based in Sharn and Eberron, where we played the superheroes out to save the city. And yeah. we ran those in like, individual one shots where we leveled every time and we were it was great the shards there was a theme song and everything i do remember Julian, the theme song. yeah will the shards live again <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. will the shards live again well i think i still have the sharn book um <laughs> you know if if people if if that same group of people were interested in in a, in in revisiting uh, Eberron and Sharn specifically, I, I would consider doing it. Okay. My uh, my my love of, of gaming and storytelling is that I put a, one story to bed and I think of new ideas and, and play the next thing. That's usually don't go go back and revisit too much. But I did love that campaign a lot, and I will say I've had um, uh, a lot of games since then that are variations on trying to like draw. Uh -huh. um, and like the he mentioned, like thing Storm Hollow pulling on past game experiences, uh, a lot of things went into the creation of the City Adventure, but uh, no small amount was it inspired by uh, how much I love the Book of Sharn and its like massive city and uh, and the adventuring in it. And I definitely was as mm -hmm. we were in the City Adventure had a, a picture in my head of like uh, uh, like what it would be like to be like you know the superheroes in this big city. So uh, yeah. Maybe, maybe even beyond the back to the city of Sharn and the Shards, right again. If anyone wants to do a, a city superheroes in Storm Hollow, I could I could run a venture game of cards. You know, transport. Very nice. The same idea. <laughs> new new toys to play with. Perfect, perfect. Well, I am really excited uh, about that for sure. Because uh, more superheroes shards. is great. We are the Shards. Um, <laughs> I know Tim's a little dance. Uh, I know his dance every time. Um, where uh where i will do plugs in a little bit i suppose but i, I want to know where can people find you online uh on twitter uh places uh, where should they find online you? yeah twitter is pretty much the only social media i really pay attention to um i'm at drag morian uh on twitter um or you can search by my name julian lebron titus it probably comes up mm -hmm. uh, yeah beyond that i don't i don't i don't do this so i finally have started to do that one a little bit in a mild proficient i'm usually terrible at social media but i <laughs> Gotten, I've been yeah. working on that one this year, and I'm doing a little better. You a little bit better? Since 2012, but I've really been trying since 2020. Absolutely. Well, perfect. Well, I'm glad you are here. This is great. We're gonna we're gonna get Justin back in here because we got to write some adventure together. Um, hey, all right. I my, my goodness. I don't even know where my brain is right now for this one. <laughs> is this a is this a system agnostic? Are we writing a D and D adventure or just a theoretical adventure for some place? <laughs> That's a great question. This adventure could be anything. Um, usually, we, we kind of focus with with a, I don't know D and D ish mindset, but uh, that's fine. People are most most people are familiar with that more than other systems, so sure. Right, right. Welcome back, Justin. Welcome. Yep, yep. <laughs> Just don't mind me. I don't know. We've been talking. Did did anything percolate with you, Justin? Do you have a thought in mind about where we could start this ridiculous adventure? <laughs> um. So, so no, I, while you guys were, were talking, I, I heard some smack talk, uh, from you, Rich. <laughs> and then I also heard that, uh, you guys skipped over my favorite edition of D and D, which is fourth edition. So I, uh, I, I started looking up information about uh, Doge, Dogecoin. So I have no clue <laughs> what, we, what we should be talking about. Oh, we so, broke you. Oh, my goodness. Funny you should mention that. I, I did mostly skip over your favorite edition of 4th <laughs> Yeah, that's fine. not fun. my favorite. No, I, have a lot I of didn't enjoy it. It, but... it did a lot of really cool things, but it just wasn't my <laughs> Right, yeah. I, you know, and that's the thing is I skip, pretty much skipped over 3.5. I, uh, I, I, I wasn't a, a, a huge fan of that edition, but that's, you know, I, once again. Yeah. I, I have, have to tell you that 
there there was a wonderful day where Julian brought me back a player's handbook signed by the designers um, from Gen Con. <laughs> it was a good day. So yeah. third ed, third ed was like our place. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I love that. Yeah, special nice. place in my heart forever. But... Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, oh man, did my 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 stuff disappeared? Where'd it go? Oh no! Come on back! Come on back there, adventure. <laughs> yeah, the adventure's gone. Well, no adventure for us. Uh... <laughs> well, right. um, let's see. Well, yeah, well, here, I'm gonna. Yeah, I'll get it up. You guys, keep you get doing that together. Go to a, a cyberpunk adventure. The data you need is lost in the system. Desperate. Oh my goodness! <laughs> Wait, that's a that's an option. I mean, yeah. <laughs> right. Um, so let's see. Um, uh, where could we be in the uh, not too far future? Because, of course, it is Google that is hiding this Google Docs form from us. <laughs> <laughs> right. Google. Unless... Do we have to go with Google or something? <laughs> I know. I'm going to I'm going to try to pull up Google. Don't mind me. OK. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but you guys could go ahead and start talking about it and I'll join in just a second. Yeah. I, I'm always interested in cyberpunk. Like cyberpunk is is cool because it is a, a future that we can see. Like it's not too distinct, but it's distinct enough. Um, and yeah. it is a pretty good one to talk about because uh, as uh, what was it three weeks ago? Maybe it was actually the day when Shadowrun was created or something. Oh, like when the when the like the whatever apocalypse that is the story genesis for Shadowrun. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we're past. Yeah, that's it. the that's the, the the danger for yeah. I think it's the goblinization. It's like it's, the story of Shadowrun is something like there's some sort of apocalypse, and then people start sprouting up as orcs and trolls and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And then the game yeah. set several decades after that. But uh, yeah, the the interesting conundrum with any cyberpunk is that it's it's meant to be just like the not so distant future, but like just enough. And uh, we've reached a point in our own like timeline where. Um, yeah, we've hit some of the benchmarks of, like initial cyberpunk, like like actual years they'd be covering, and obviously things are very very different. But also, some things of the predictions are eerily close in some ways, and you know, right? A lot of uh, like one of the big thing themes of cyberpunk is always like the amount of like corporate control and hegemony over over uh, the governments or over mm-hmm. people's daily lives, and uh, depending on you know. Uh, how you how you feel about things, you know, how things have gone over the last year and how stock markets are doing. I mean, there's certain perspectives of of like uh, not feeling like we're that far off. And I think those uh, concerns um, are pretty strong with people right now. So I think that's a good time for cyberpunk in that regards because uh, it's, yeah. it's a, a fear that is worth exploring in the modern times. I like it. Well, then I, I feel like we should probably start there, right? I mean, as usual, Chef Owlbear D has a need. Um, yeah. And probably this time it's a need for a new, not like an ingredient, but like a new tool um, to oh, add Chef to the needs... kitchen back at the mm-hmm. RPG Exploration Society. Um, <laughs> so uh, I do just want to make sure. Yeah. <laughs> Oop, I, I just want to make sure and say, hey, uh, Boys Games, welcome to the chat. And uh, yes, breakfast soup is a great way to go so there we go wow yeah 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 i could do a breakfast soup like something like kind of like uh like maybe with like some almost like a an egg soup but like spicy i think would be really good for breakfast i was just trying to think what type of soup i would want to throw a fried egg into yeah like a fried egg uh maybe like a boiled egg yeah uh, yeah something yeah Anyway, something, something something spicy with a little bit of savoriness to it. I'm into it. All right. Split feet. <laughs> yeah. All right. So chef chef needs a new tool, and he is going to send members of the and he's sending members of the uh, exploration society. Of course, right? As usual, through one of the doors, right? Through one of the doors. Chef's got um, some doors. Chef's got some doors, and and. Uh, and he's sending people through them. Also, just so everyone knows, you too can be part of the Exploration Society and go through these doors by signing up for our Patreon. Um, <laughs> hopefully a link for that will pop up in the chat here shortly. But uh, if you just look up the Saving Throw Show Patreon, you'll find us. There it is, patreon.com slash Saving Throw Show. Thanks, DJ Regular. <laughs> you know, gotta, Amazing. Got, gotta get those plugs in when I can, right? All right, right. right. So, Exploration Society, we're going through the door. We're going to cyberpunk land. 
right? And I, I feel like we we need a tool that is like futuristic. It's something that Chef has heard about. It's going to revolutionize everything here in the kitchen. Um, I don't know what that could be, but you got to go to the distant. Well, this this place, travel through time mm -hmm. and space to get it. <laughs> maybe um, uh, maybe it's a a special spice grinder. Sure. Because because we've recently uh, sent adventurers off to get special spices. So it's a special spice grinder for the um, for the spices to uh, make them edible. Right. And, and spreadable in yeah. soup. <laughs> fusion this powered isn't... spice grinder. Yep. Ooh. A fusion. Ooh. It's a fusion powered Ooh. spice grinder. Okay. I like that. Right. Uh, especially because maybe that's not a tool that we're going to have anywhere on the streets. We need to go somewhere specialized. We got to find the right people in order to discover this. So um, who, of course, are we going to run into as we get out of this portal? I mean, we we certainly, as usual, so, need a guide to this new realm. We do. We do. We do. <laughs> I, I, I do have I do have a question, though. Like so the Mr. Fusion and Back to the Future. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so so my my question on this uh if you were to play a game of Shadowrun, you're very likely to be a street level, uh, you know, runner, and you're probably going to get up to some no good. Are we sure. thinking that our adventures are going to get up to maybe a little bit of no good? I, I mean, if they're going to go steal a fusion powered spice grinder, I feel like someone. Someone doesn't want them to do that, and they're going to have to get up some trouble to get to it. Yeah. Okay. I, yeah. I, I, I was just checking the steal portion. Are we planning on stealing this? So perfect. That's what I needed to know. I, uh, yeah, because I feel like we are individuals, which means that if we want to get something, we have to take it from the authority of some kind. I mean, that's mm -hmm. that's kind of the cyberpunk idea, right? Yeah. yeah. Indiv yeah. Individuality we, has a, mm -hmm. a penalty. <laughs> plus, they're, plus, they're going into this, this far-flung future. I mean, they don't... They don't necessarily have the kind of currency they need to even buy this. And you know, if this is this is awesome tech, even for the time they're going to, it's probably like a closely guarded secret um, mm -hmm. that the, this uh, chef has uncovered. So yeah, I think it'd probably be protected, and they're they're going to have to uh, to 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 steal it. If we want to make them feel better about that, we could we could have it be intended for some other nefarious purpose that they are preventing by oh absolutely sure. all right yeah. so we're going to cyberpunk land as 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 the party is going <laughs> through the the portal through the door chef hands each of them a set of goggles and these are the ar goggles that allow them to interact with the world um i like that okay uh and then uh so and then our our, our patron uh i think our patron should be like an ai uh, that is in the goggles, right? So they see it through Ooh. augmented reality. Do they like hop into like there? We didn't expect this, right? They just suddenly show up on all of our comms. Yeah, um, yeah. So, so like, you get through the portal, and all of a sudden, is. there's. Yeah. Oh no! You get through the portal, and you see someone standing there, and you lift up your goggles, and they're not there. They're just in your goggles, and they're there to guide you. Who is this guide? Who is our guide? Uh, and how does this guide going to get us get us to a cache with all the things we're going to need to get this? <laughs> or right. if 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 you play, uh, you know, um, plenty of, uh, of uh, cyberpunk games, you might be getting a Johnson, and the Johnson is the person who sends you off to mm. the gig. Or you might oh oh here we go ready, someone who helps you cross borders is a coyote. Uh, so maybe it's a uh, a coyote hybrid looking creature. Uh, oh, okay, okay. Creature <laughs> named uh, named something like uh, uh, let's go like Lawrence, right? But it's spelled Lawrence like the yeah, it's Lawrence the coyote, but it's it's w or it's L dot A dot W, you know. So. <laughs> <laughs> what does okay. that stand for? Nobody knows. So, Lawrence, the the hybrid coyote, is your AR guide, and uh, that's like a that. lot of mystery in there. I like I, now. I'm not sure. Do we know this is an AI? Do we think this might be someone else, like under in a disguise? I mean, we're we're meant to not really know who they are, right? Yeah, we're yeah. Just we meant don't to know. Trust them somehow. Well, exactly. Maybe. <laughs> We've got that their their name is spelled out in all caps with periods. Lawrence is clearly an acronym for something, but we don't really know what. Right? That's the yeah. yeah. Idea. Yeah. All right. Can I even be like maybe Lawrence knows a little bit, but he keeps forgetting, like a little bit of a fracture. Like sometimes it appears as a coyote in your yeah. head. 
yeah fractures a little bit you see glimmers of like a humanoid face and you're like snaps yeah. back yeah he doesn't know yeah. what that was about mm-hmm. <laughs> i love the idea that the the la stands for law abiding no, i don't remember the rest of it like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I i yeah no i i, I like that the coyote kill character remembers <laughs> law abiding Mm-hmm. And then there's something some reversing back in there. Which is strange because that's in my name, but we're definitely not going to do that right now. <laughs> right. Yeah. Nope. nope. But I would in a normal situation. In a normal situation. Heroes. Yeah. Oh, that's right. The situation is too dire. Oh man. Oh. <laughs> I also like. I don't know quite what the purpose is yet. I mean, maybe it's like a actually like some sort of matter converter that they're going to use to like power some insane weapon. But I like the idea that the reason the the AI is trying to help you steal this is because an if something like super weaponized and it's a little shocked when it learns like you want it to grind like yeah i guess it can convert a, spice, <laughs> a, a thing into spike like sure but it could fuse stars into like sure a spike you're gonna add it to your spice right? yeah right. yeah okay yeah as long as it's All out right. of here <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay so uh yeah the pcs let uh let the guide know what they are looking for or there's some kind of conversation there uh the guide is surprised that uh that is all they want it for a grinder but you'll do i guess all right right. (laughs) um all right so what is the name of the evil megacorp that we're going to have to infiltrate. Well, because clearly if we're in steampunk land or cyberpunk land, we need an evil megacorp. Yeah. You got to have one. Um, good evil megacorp name. Uh, blizzards of the toast. I'm fine with that. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> I was just remembering in, in, uh, what's that movie? Shaolin soccer, where it is just like team evil. <laughs> yeah, team evil, right? Yeah, <laughs> it could just be Megacorp. I think Megacorp, Megacorp is. I think Megacorp's <laughs> in something already, though. Uh, so I I like this Blizzards of the Toast though because um, why why do we need these these characters that might be like from a heroic world? Do they need to like? Do we need to insert them into some sort of like fantasy MMO in order to hack the thing that they need? Is there? Oh yeah. <laughs> I love the idea of a group hacking experience because um, yeah. that's always the downside for me of a, a cyberpunk is like, well, I'm the hacker and everyone else go get some snacks. <laughs> so, me and the DM got some work to do. <laughs> let's get everyone in there. <laughs> yeah. All right. So uh, let's, let's, let's go with, uh, you know, the shadow run normal thing. So, so we have our information, we have our Johnson. Now it's time to gather information. That's going to yes. be, you know, our, our leg work. Um, right. So for legwork, th- what kind of information will they need? They need to find where the item is stored. Yep. Uh, what uh, kind of guards they expect? Yeah. Uh, and then uh, gather tools needed uh, needed for infiltration or whatever. Yeah. So I think uh, well, with uh, yeah. Richard, you mentioned like maybe some MMO sort of vibes. So I think that's how they... Are the is the heist itself happening in in meat space or virtual space? Oh yeah, going through I, this. Ooh, I was thinking physical, and this would be a way to gain some information or maybe overcome um, yeah, some see. sort of of computer that would you know opposition of some kind. Gotcha. Um, uh, so like the maybe it's, maybe it's, yeah MMO thing is the information gathering part where they're they're using to get the info, but the actual heist is get into a building. I think so. I think so. Yeah. So we could go here and like, you know, part of this is going to be hacking the, um, the system of blizzard, uh, of B O T T, uh, hacking the system of B O T T to acquire, uh, the needed information. I like this too, because if we're, if these are the same players that, uh, you know, most of these, uh, these kitchen missions are, are a little more fantasy based. Uh, we can let them have some cyberpunk fun, but like in the in the hack mission, they're going to BTT Corp through this uh, virtual world. Uh, it can neat, look like a silly fantasy world that feels mm-hmm. little for them, and they can solve problems in that way. Yeah, uh, into a computer, even if it looks like a treasure chest. You know? 
Right. So and they, they, then they unplug the the cords from their head um, as they are back in the skyscraper, you know, and get back to yeah. this future reality. Um, <laughs> and then they have to go in physically. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So 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 the skill challenge will be through some sort of VR. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it'll be physical puzzles. Uh, maybe maybe even a combat. Right. Um, yeah. You have to fight off the. Uh, uh, you have to fight off the antivirus. <laughs> the waves of like goblins that are eight bit sprites moving at you. <laughs> like, yeah, eight bit space goblins. invaders style. <laughs> yeah. All right. Maybe so you're a big bad evil guy that's commanding them or something like that. When you finally get him and defeat him, that's the the AI in charge of security. So once he's down, not only do you have the information, but you created this unique opportunity where the security's down for the most part in the building. So now you've got the opportunity to like go. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. Oh my gosh. I was just thinking uh, about um, about Snow Crash. Um, and there's a moment in there, right, where hero mm -hmm. protagonist, the protagonist and hero of the book, um, <laughs> like duels Wait, who is someone. the protagonist like, of the book? A hero protagonist. Okay. And that's <laughs> um, the protagonist hero of the book. It's the, that's the hero <laughs> of the book, yes. Um, yeah. Most uh, disappointing ending someone. ever of the book. Oh. <laughs> But the duel at the start is kind of interesting, right? Where you it meet is. him, I think the first thing, um, they do this uh, this, uh, this sword fight and slashes through the enemy and they kind of are kicked out of the world. I think they're banned from that area for like a year or something like that mm -hmm. as a result. But I love that it's, it's a cool moment that has consequences in the digital space. But I kind of like the idea that they fight someone in this digital world, and that is a consequence in like the physical heist later on. Like <laughs> they beat yeah. an enemy that they're gonna have to beat again uh, in reality. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. There's the uh, the head of IT mm -hmm. is uh, and his uh, and their avatar is in there, and they have to fight him. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be fun. It makes it like you know, head of IT is this yeah. insane sort of monster-looking thing um, in a in the digital space, and maybe maybe at first slightly less impressive when you meet them in in meet space. At first, yes, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, and this is this is one of those things where uh, there can be clues that build a way to defeat the head of IT. Mm -hmm. So you realize like, that they have quite a bit of cyberware going on. Yeah. <laughs> Like, like right. to access uh, certain uh, databases, uh, you need to shoot out a control panel or something, right? And so, and then in this fight, you know, you see, uh, you see several control panels in the uh, in the room that you're fighting in. Yes. And. Uh, and or, that will mm -hmm. deactivate um, aspects of the head of IT, right? I like it. I like the idea that you're looking at it in the digital world and it looks like, you know, it looks like a crystal. It looks like a campfire that's a certain color yeah. or something like that. But when you get up close, you, you try to activate it and you realize it is just like a switch. Um, and so maybe there's like a blue and a purple and a pink switch that you find yep. here. And then when you get in the real world, you're like, hold on. <laughs> I see, uh, Okay. <laughs> I see mm -hmm. these three switches. <laughs> yeah, no. So yeah, so so you kind of you kind of you kind of you know l l they learn that and then that's how they def eventually like power like the 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 head of IT is 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 this god, right? And and so you can't <laughs> you can't fight them until you start deactivating some of these around the room. And then you sure. can kind of do your phased combat with some some of the things that they learned from the puzzles. And uh yeah, no, I think that'd be a ton of fun. I okay, totally okay. Agree. So this is good. So what what are the phases? Because I like, like Julian said, you know, initially, IT director not not imposing, <laughs> like not right. You're a little yeah. like, you why see, are we once fighting? You see, once you see yeah. him in meat space, actually, he's just sort of like mm -hmm. a guy in a suit or maybe a guy in a shabby shirt, you know, like oh, okay, right? a little so, rumpled so, or something so, like that. Like not been working too long, too late, didn't care about his appearance that much, uh, mm -hmm. or two than that, because otherwise. So uh, you know the uh, the um, uh, monster boss energy encounter. drinks everywhere. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we'll call it the boss encounter. Um, this is against uh, you know versus head of IT, head right? Of IT uh, in meat space. 
So let's talk about this head of IT. So they're 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 not going to be initially. They're not going to be very imposing. Not right. very imposing. Yeah. Overworked. So, um, uh, you know. Yeah. Looks yeah. like an overworked, normal guy. Uh, scruffy beard. Maybe there are some minions around so that people like fight them first or something. Yeah. I mean, I don't want this adventure yeah. to end by like, well, I go punch that IT director. Well, so I got an idea about that. Since you guys want okay. like panel shut down, right? Yeah. Um, my thought is, so you do your your virtual run or whatever to like shut down, and, and you TI guy this like big monster form, right? And when you get to a meet space, he's not that impressive. And rather than suddenly like flipping out and like having like crazy cyberware on him, uh, to make it a more of a, a traveling fight. Uh, you got to look for those panels. Maybe he's got like his own like virtual panic room or something like that. Like he steps inside, you can't like it's solid. You can't even easily get to him. Sure. Uh, he starts like activating security systems. So maybe you know maybe that's when like minions start coming out, whether they're like you know uh, android type fighters or or other like security or you yeah know, cameras with lasers and stuff like that. But uh, on your way to various panels, um, he's got different security setups that he's got to like prevent you. That way we're giving like a fun variety of challenges and this. Gives a little more of that heist feel too, because rather than it just be a straight on yeah. fight, you're actually like fighting an environment maybe to try and like get to certain access points. Mm -hmm. You can just treat like whatever he gets the shield like you can see him be all un unimpressive and he makes like some snide remark, steps into a thing, it goes down, and you know, you just basically say whatever the players do to try and get through, like you know, there's a all intents and purposes magical power shield or it's native yeah. vibranium or whatever you need to be like you're not getting through until you you do some of these things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, activate uh, drones, traps, etc. And the oh, yeah. PCs need to deactivate those and the shield. Right, and he's, definitely there's a message. Oh yeah, go ahead. And he's just going to be a pushover when, uh, when, when, whenever we get through all that too. Yeah, yeah, you'll have that nice fun moment of like when you finally get to the the scrawny bastard who's been using his like brain and skills to mess with you and tech. But yeah. <laughs> And you can even yeah. have a moment beforehand where he like, you know, if you want that, like, I don't just want him to run up and punch, like, find a way, like get the jump on him. You can have him like run up and punch and have him like reel back and like fall like into the panic room and like, oh, <laughs> fools. yeah. <laughs> All right. Oh, I like this. I, I love the idea that you hit these switches and they're like, All right, um, what, security shutdown, 33 percent. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, sending auxiliary forces and like more things come out mm -hmm. or the next trap or yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, cool. cool. All right, well, let's jump back to the legwork. Um, what kind sure. of other security would they likely be expecting? Um, you know, it, it is cyberpunk, so you know, with Shadowrun, you don't need a bunch of combats. Uh, you could probably get away with just one big one at the end, and then like the little itty bitty ones whenever they're in in uh, the VR. So it yes. doesn't necessarily need to be like combats but it could be things that they have to avoid like maybe they have a giant robot with tank treads uh that patrols right sure so sure. then so then they can they can avoid it pretty easily uh they could deactivate it uh they could try to take it over right so yeah, so it gives like them some this. options there um, okay I like this because what about, I mean, as our, our AI Lauren said at the start, um, there's, we're only going to use this to grind some spice. I mean, there's, there's another group of runners over here who's trying to take it to get some weapons, right? So maybe mm -hmm. during our legwork, we see them also doing legwork. And if we destroy oh. this robot, it's just going to let them in. So we have mm -hmm. to like take care of the robot while leaving it on patrol, <laughs> whether that is sneaking past or taking it over. Yeah, so legwork. Uh, let's see. At some point during the first uh, phase of legwork, the PCs find another group of runners uh, after the grinder as well. Uh, as well, but they plan on uh, selling it to the highest bidder. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. For building a weapon. Right. And so maybe that does, like, 
convince our players to take a less physical approach to things. I can't smash yeah. everything because that's just going to let these other folks in too. So I do right. want to like avoid or, you know, take over, but without destruction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, no. And that's, that's, that's something that could be easily like done here. They could avoid it. They could deactivate it. They could try to take it over and program it to get in the way of the other shadow runners too. Right. Mm -hmm. That's, that's an option. All yeah. right, so we have giant robot with tank treads that patrols the area. Uh, what what other kind of like security things might we find? Might we look for that they might want to avoid or alter or that type of stuff? I mean, this could come up later, but I love like a skill challenge. I did this. I've done this in Honey Heist before. Um, yeah. A skill challenge based. I don't like. This room's got a laser maze. This room's got a pit trap. This room's got saw blades, mm -hmm. you know, like this. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know exactly what's the the cool cyberpunk version of that is, but like I love the idea that there are some skill challenges that they have to make to to avoid kind of the basic security system of the place before they get up to the IT floor. Yeah. So it is it is both a factory uh or it is a factory. There we go. It is a factory that also has a bunch of traps. <laughs> so, you know, conveyor Sorry, belts. Sorry, a cyberpunk? <laughs> no. No, that's great. No, so conveyor belts uh, and, like, la uh, uh, cameras uh, or just, I, yeah. I take piece of technology is right there past the roof. Looking for yeah. intruders <laughs> with lasers on them, right? Uh Oh my gosh. Uh, I love you know, this. I, yeah. To get to the IT room, to get to the IT room, uh, you need to, you know, bypass a, uh, a huge gap with, uh, tools made for, uh, uh, with tools made for destroying a defective product. Oh, there we go. There we go. It's a uh, you have to play a game of Robo Rally right here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Some Robo Rally action, right? Yeah, like it's oh, an automated a uh, uh, facility that is you know got a lot of machinery that's building you know, whatever microchips and, and cyberware and stuff like that, and also maybe destroying old junk. Uh, yeah, players from not this age don't really understand what the heck's going on. There's just a lot of machinery moving around, and it's not necessarily designed to be laser traps and pit traps and all that sort of stuff. It just ends up being that if you're trying to move yeah. through the place where it's not even meant for like, for the most part, meet people to like have to move through. Like usually you would shut it down before anyone's going to walk through here, but they're not going to do right. that. So you got to. Yeah. And this. then the gathering right. tools that they need, this is, this is a little more free form. This is, you know, working with Lawrence. Lawrence is going to have some connections to help them get the things that they need to accomplish this task. So I've got some questions here. I think this is this is an important one. Um, yeah. If our folks are coming from a fantasy zone, yeah. do we give them fantasy equivalents or do we give them future stuff? Like, are they picking up? Uh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I, I have no idea. That, Rail I guns. There we go. Well, <laughs> or I, I think that <laughs> depends on the system that we designed this for, right? If we design okay. it for fifth edition, then um, you know, I, I I think I think we do. Well, I think we do future stuff anyway, but I think if we design it for fifth edition, we use that idea like, okay, well, you know, they're not all going to have laser pistol proficiency. So maybe yeah. it's a hand crossbow, but it looks like a laser pistol, right? right or right. if we did this in like Shadowrun or Cyberpunk Red, then we could just use the established tools there. Yeah. And we could, uh, I, I like the idea of maybe giving them a little bit of an option. Like um, they can pick up uh, something that seems familiar to them. Like maybe it's a, you know, like you said, like a virus or something like that. That's just a, a strictly more effective version, uh, but has limitations of like, you know, still a sword. Or if they want to pick up like a laser cannon, maybe they have something like disadvantage to attack, but it does like, you know, this incredible futuristic, amazing weapon. Yeah. Uh, that they can try and figure out and make work for them, but it's uh, mm -hmm. maybe a little janky for them to try because it's, it's a little more alien to them. Right. I like that too, because it, it gives them the potential of going back and still having these, but like their batteries are going to run out. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. That's what I, was, I was exactly thinking that like we're going to give them lots of fun toys and they run on a, uh, a, some sort of battery system that is totally alien to the world. And yeah, it either like shuts down mm -hmm. as you get back 
or if the if the story or DM whatever wants to let them have fun, you're like, all right, it's running out of juice. You've got like ten shots left on this thing, and then it's gone. Use them wisely. Yeah, right. And the chef could hook it up to Mister Fusion, and it would be fine for a while. But he's not gonna. <laughs> he's got spices. He needs to make. He's got spices to grind. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, I believe we have created yet another fantastic adventure. This is uh, ridiculous. There, I love it. There is there is only one thing left. And this is the most important thing, and that is the title. <sighs> what is the title of this adventure? Oof. I know. I'm going to go with Burnt Toast. Burnt Toast? Unless anyone else has something better. Oh, mm. Burnt gives me this uh, uh, Burn Notice vibe to it, so I almost want Lawrence to be a spy now. <laughs> that's that's oh, the big well, reveal at the end. <laughs> Lawrence could come back, right? You know? Yeah. <laughs> very nice very are we nice. going with burnt toast i'm going, going with burnt once toast. I'm going, going burnt toast. twice three times thank you so much it's burnt toast there wow. we go <laughs> burnt yeah. toast burnt toast uh head to the future hack a corporation gather uh <laughs> Mr. Fusion Spice Grinder. Great. Mr. Fusion Spice Grinder. Perfect. <laughs> yes. uh, all right. Well, um, I think that is that's kind of the end of things. So uh one last time. Thank you so much, Julian, for joining us today. Thanks for having me. It was a lot uh, of fun. Awesome. Make sure to to hunt Julian down on the internet, follow him. Uh don't do anything too creepy. Uh just just follow him on the internet. <laughs> Yeah. Don't really hunt them down. <laughs> you can but, you can join the amazing pack of I think I'm up to 84 followers on Twitter. Woo! Oh dang. Oh dang. Amazing. All right. <laughs> well, everyone, uh let's let's go ahead and go to our wrap-up screen. All and right. uh this will just be me and Rich. Thank you. That I mean, that was a good guest. Thanks for thanks for wrangling I mean, yeah. uh Julian. That was fantastic. <laughs> so that was a uh, lot of fun. Yeah, another great episode. Uh, thank you so much for everyone hanging out with us. Uh, I think our reviews told us go check out the new Munchkin and go check out the new DC, DC deck building. Mm -hmm. uh, I hope you all enjoyed Burnt Toast. I know I did. And uh, <laughs> Rich, what? Where? Where can people see you? What? What's? Uh, what's cooking in your world right now? I do have to say that if you want to get a copy of Twill's Twist Points, uh, it is going on Drive Through RPG later this week for purchase. I'll put the whole thing on screen. There we go. Um, Fun little zine where you can add some exploration uh, to your game of Fifth Ed D&D. Um, awesome. Other than that, the Academy is getting started in a couple of weeks, so I'm just mm -hmm. resting up and uh, spending too much time planning uh, an entire summer camp. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and are all spots uh, taken now for camp, or can Ooh. people still sign up? Good question. You can go to academyofadventures.com. There are a few spaces left uh, there for sale on my Square store there. Awesome. And yeah. Um, yeah, and then you can always check me out at DJ Pirate Rabbits. I stream every Saturday and Wednesday here on Twitch, uh, usually a little bit of house music, and uh, sometimes we watch a movie. So it's a, it's a ton of fun. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, come hang out. And uh, with that, uh, like I like to say, make sure and leave your crock pot on warm. And we'll see you next time. <laughs>